Go ahead. Welcome to Alta's first ever virtual advocacy summit. This is the first webinar in a three part series. I would like to thank all of our advocacy summit sponsors, including today's featured webinar sponsor, the FNF family of companies. This webinar is being recorded and will be viewable on Alta's website later this week. It should be noted that the contents of this slide deck is an Alta product. The definitive positions of the GSEs are reflected in their respective guides, lender letters, bulletins, and other published guidance. All attendees are in listen-only mode, but, be, but please feel free to submit your questions through the question box at the top of your screen. We have set time aside at the end of this webinar for Q&A. Today's panel will be moderated by Chris Morton. Chris recently joined the Alta staff as the Senior Vice President of Public Affairs. In this role, Chris will lead Alta's policy development, political engagement, and lobbying strategy. Chris recently served as Executive Vice President of Government Affairs and Business Strategy at the Association for Advanced Life Underwriting. He had an influential role in major legislative undertakings, such as the Dodd-Frank Act, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and the SECURE Act. I would now like to turn it over to Chris to introduce our panelists. And, and good morning to those of you on the West Coast. I, I'm really excited to be with you all today and to officially be a part of the Alta team. I'm looking forward really to working with all of you and getting to know each of you. Uh, it's a really a pleasure to welcome you to our first ever uh, Alta at Virtual Advocacy Summit. Uh, this is the first in a series of events like this that we will be doing, and we hope you'll get great value uh, from those. Um, I also want to say that I, I really hope everyone is staying safe and healthy at this time. It's really important, as we all know, to take care of those that we love, our friends and our family, and of course, those that you serve in the marketplace. Uh, today, we're going to be exploring how GSE guidance updates impact the title industry. And as you all know, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have modified their seller guides and provided temporary guidance on several policy areas to support mortgage originations, including things like limited powers of attorney, uh, acceptance of remote online notarization or RON, and requirements for gap coverage. So today we're going to hear from leadership from the GSEs and learn how these changes will affect closings and title insurance policies. And among the key items that we're gonna to address today uh, will include closing requirements for the use of powers attorney for the borrower, uh, for the use of remote uh, online notarization on loans that include wedding sign promissory notes, determination of states where GSEs accept RON, closings where notary witnesses wedding sign remotely via tools like Zoom or Skype, uh, and loan policy requirements concerning gap coverage. And so to, uh, to join me today to unpack some of these items, we have three folks uh, from uh, Freddie Mac, John Valdivielso, Associate General Counsel with Freddie Mac, Jim Newell, Managing Associate General Counsel with Freddie Mac, John Breeding, the Insurance Policy Manager uh, from Freddie Mac, and, and two folks from Fannie Mae. I'd like to welcome John Burley and Brooke Adams, both Associate General Counsels of Fannie Mae, and of course, here uh, in-house, my colleague, our expert, Steve Gottheim, our Senior Counsel, who's going to uh, help us walk through all of these items. Uh, but before we get uh, started, our friends at SoftPro have a special message that they'd like to share with all of you. Hi, I'm Leslie Wyatt, Director of Regulatory Compliance with SoftPro. Thank you for your continued support, especially with this year's virtual Alta Advocacy Summit. For the past 36 years, SoftPro has strived to be a voice and advocate for our customers. In this ever-changing time in our industry, we pride ourselves on our ability to respond to changes and provide our customers with the information and technology they need to adapt. Our award-winning software is secure and fully scalable to fit your needs. Whether you're a sole proprietor, a multi-state location, or need a hosted solution that allows you to work from anywhere, 
our software covers all aspects of the closing process, from commercial closings, powerful automation, and over 70 integrations with vendors and underwriters. Combined with our best-in-class support team, it's why SoftPro is the industry leader. Here at SoftPro, we recognize that our customers are the reason we're able to do what we do every day. We invite you to call us to schedule a demo, and we welcome all of you to join our SoftPro family. Well, I'd like to uh, thank the folks uh, from SoftPro certainly for uh, for that announcement. And uh, one thing I'd like to also note uh, before we move on to the webinar itself is the team at Alta has done just a tremendous job putting together the COVID Resources Center on our website. And we'd encourage everyone to visit that at alta.org backslash coronavirus. On our homepage, as well as at that link, you'll find information on operating status of recording jurisdictions, uh, information on state RON orders, and things like uh, background and how you can take advantage of the federal relief packages that have been passed by Congress and obviously those that will uh, come forward even further in the future. So I would encourage everyone to take the opportunity to dig into those resources and as always, we are here to help and serve you with any questions that you may have. So we want to jump right in now to uh, to the webinar. I'll, I'll mention uh, for those of you who do have questions, please enter those uh, on the box on your screen and we'll try to get as many uh, to as many of those as we can. Uh, and certainly if, if there are questions that we don't get to, uh, we will uh, certainly follow up and provide uh, further information and detail uh, to uh, answer those questions for you. Uh, so I think we're going to jump right into it uh, with uh, with Jim Newell, and we're going to talk a little bit about remote online uh, notarization or RON. So Jim, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, I uh, I'm uh, honored to be the, the first speaker in the first uh, summit. So uh, thanks for uh, having us uh, here and uh, thanks to Alta for setting this up and, and to everyone out there, thanks for uh, tuning in. We uh, welcome the chance to talk about our our expanded capabilities um, in response to the tough times we're all going through and, and understanding the industry, trying to keep closings uh, going when we can't uh, congregate together as we normally would. And um, suddenly there are a lot of uh, uh, a lot of electronic and uh, technology based solutions that are top of mind for folks to do this. And so we've been working very very hard um, uh, along with uh, FHFA um, to uh, come up with these uh, expanded capabilities and to do it in an aligned uh, fashion. So uh, obviously one of the things that, um, that the industry is struggling with is uh, the availability of, of notaries to complete uh, these closings when uh, uh, at, least, at least some of and, and uh, possibly several of the documents in a closing are uh, required to be uh, to be notarized. Um, it's uh, it's tough to uh, find them, and when you do, um, it's it's uh, almost impossible to uh, get everybody uh, in a room in the traditional way. So uh, the uh, the process that's known as remote online notarization um, has been uh, top of mind for a lot of folks. So we'll get right into it in terms of. Uh, describing just what that what that is uh, and then a little later on what it isn't um, but uh, the uh, uh, remote online authorization which often gets the acronym RON uh, is uh, the authentication of a signature for an electronic record uh, by a notary using audiovisual technology um, where the uh, and, and this is important, where the documents are signed electronically, uh, the document is uh, tamper sealed electronically, um, and uh, the notarial seal is being applied electronically. That's, that's uh, an important way to talk about this, and again, there's uh, some lack of consistency out there in the world as to how uh, RON is, uh, is described. So what we're telling you is how the GSEs uh, when we use that term, uh, what we mean, uh, and it, it is uh, a, an electronic uh, process uh, 
um, where the uh, the underlying documents are created and signed electronically, and then the notary is also uh, notarizing electronically. And the remote aspect is, is where the 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 audiovisual technology is being is being leveraged, and uh, it's it's the it's the uh, it's the process really that has been identified and enacted in several states. I think there's 23 states now that have uh, Ron statutes on the books, and and this is what they're talking about in those statutes. Um, uh, typically, the uh, uh, the notaries are actually trained and licensed, uh, in particular, to be uh, e-notaries, if you will, and to perform. Um, to perform this process, and in those uh, state laws, they're often uh, they're often uh, uh, authorized not only to do it within their state, but also authorized to go out into other states and perform that uh, the notarial acts are there. And that's a little bit more of a controversial uh, proposition, but it is how those laws are are stated, and so um, it it forms the the basis for where we start out with what this process is. So. Um, uh, when, uh, when you look at, uh, the situations that sound on the, on the surface, like they might be Ron and some, and some folks I've seen articles, I've seen, you know, presentations where they're con considered Ron, but they're not. So we wanted to definitely, uh, clarify what's, what we're not considering Ron when we, when we, uh, have that, uh, in our, uh, most recent, uh, communications. Um, and so, uh, what, one of the things that is not, Ron, in our, in our view is, uh, some of the stuff that has been, um, uh, authorized by, uh, temporary executive orders of the governors of, of some of the states. Uh, usually these are in states that do not have a Ron statute on the, on the books. And so they need something. And, uh, the governor in, a, in an emergency situation quite understandably, issues, uh, issues an order on a temporary basis that says, uh, uh, okay, if you've, uh, if you've got people doing a traditional kind of uh, uh, signing, uh, wet, wet ink signing of the documents, and uh, then those documents are uh, shipped over somehow, uh, to a uh, to a notary who's in a remote location um, because they they, they can't uh, congregate all together in the in the same place under the current uh, uh, lockdown and uh, distancing orders um, then that notary can um, uh, can go ahead and ink sign again apply the notary seal with you know, raised seal whatever might be required in the state however the notary has been uh, watching uh, the uh, watching the process of signing through uh, uh, audiovisual technology like FaceTime or zoom or Skype um, and so is able to do their authentication of the borrower uh, by looking at a driver's license, whatever that may, whatever that may be, and uh, uh, and then uh, observe the signing and be able to uh, do the acknowledgement on the on the deed of trust, the mortgage, the affidavit, whatever whatever might be a uh, a document needing notarization in the, in the closing. So we uh, we consider that uh, more like a traditional. Uh, traditional notarization with the with the ink signed documents and an ink signed notary, and so uh, so that's uh, not considered Ron. But that's you know there, there's there's good news and bad news there. It's not Ron, but uh, as you'll uh, see later when we we talk about it, both of the GSEs have made it clear that we do accept uh, we do accept those uh, processes as long as they. Uh, as long as they are consistent with the, the state law involved and you can get your documents recorded uh, wherever that uh, needs to be recorded and that there's a title insurance policy that doesn't take any exceptions to uh, uh, based on that uh, on that process and and some of the good news there is is, is that we do have we do have some minimum technical requirements for the RON for the use of the RON process electronic uh, and, and fairly new, um, wh whereas with regard to this ink signed uh, process that's not Ron, we, we don't have those same uh, 
uh, minimum technical requirements, and we don't have the state uh, uh, limitations that we do for uh, for Ron. Um, the uh, uh, maybe if you could go back to the previous slide just real quickly just real quickly the other thing to keep in mind is there are uniform law called rulona the revised uniform law and notarial acts i think uh in several states i think pre pre-exists uh, even uh, the ueta and uh and that's a different process too that's that's sort of like what we just uh, just described uh it's not a uh, uh, it, it's uh, not a, an electronic uh, remote online process. Uh, it, it's something more like the uh, more like the uh, wet signing, but the notary is able to uh, u utilize technology to watch it. So that's that's not a RON process either. So I'll go to the next slide. Thanks. Uh, so uh, this. Uh, process of remote online notarization uh, has been around a while. Uh, it, it's not something that propped up based upon the COVID-19 uh, emergency, and both GSEs had stuff in their guide, and in Freddie Mac's case, a, a combination of the guide and a, and a negotiated terms of, of business to accommodate Ron, even when back in the times when Corona referred to a brand of beer with a lime in it, uh, we still had the uh, uh, provisions to uh, uh, to do this. It kind of went along with uh, with our e-mortgage uh, offering in many ways, but wasn't limited uh, limited to that. Um, the uh, uh, the existing uh, requirements before the current emergency were were simply uh, that. Uh, as shown here on, on the slide, that you needed to be licensed in the in the state where you were uh, you're going to be performing the uh, notarial act, uh, and if it if it was uh, if it was remote, uh, then it depended on several uh, several things in terms of what your state had in terms of authorization. So you could uh, you could do even remote, and you could even do interstate remote. In our case, the interstate was something negotiated in a TOB. We had a guide provision that uh, was interpreted by us to uh, to allow remote online notarization within the uh, within the state if the mortgage premises were in the state where the notary was uh, was licensed. But uh, uh, but there were uh, there were provisions uh, that that would have allowed for it, and, and what we've what we've done most recently is to bring all of that into uh, into the guide and uh, and set some minimum requirements for the uh, for the use of of Ron, and of course uh, it always is overlaid with the fact that you you need to be able to get it recorded, uh, and uh, what that what. The, the sort of receiving state on this going out of state uh, notarization does the receiving state needs to recognize what you're doing and be able to record and and then the title insurers come into play where again they need to uh, ensure this without any uh, exception as to the uh, as to the process so uh, we had that then along comes uh, the emergency that we're all uh, all living through brings and and the impact that it's had on uh, on on uh, the ability to do closings and so uh that's where we've gotten together with uh, with uh, freddie mac and fannie mae working under the direction of fhfa to align this and and um, uh, we're going to turn it over i think to uh, to brooke uh to talk about uh, about what's new Hello, everyone, and thank you for uh, introducing me, Jim, and thank you to Alta for having us here. I would be remiss not to recognize our colleagues that worked on all of these uh, new standards, including our Freddie colleagues, but also FHFA, and there are several other business people from both GSEs. Uh, Fannie Mae, it was Shane Hartzler, and my other that I want to recognize. And at Freddie Mac, uh, there's another gentleman who worked, Raj. So we want to make sure we recognize there was a team effort here and we're aligned approach, making sure that when you look at one uh, GSE or the other, you're seeing the same standards. We felt it was very important to ensure that lenders could look at this, title, title underwriters could look at this, and the standards were the same. 
standards became very important where we saw varying states with different uh, requirements. And we're trying to create what we'll call an averaged approach. So we looked at what we felt like were the best standards out there that met um, the SECURE Act standards, as well as some of the Alta MBA model language standards. And other states had already uh, passed laws that had these. So some of the most important things we wanna think about are along the uh, authentication and privacy. We want to balance those with uh, what borrowers need as well as access to the technology. So again, looking at what is to the two-factor identity authentication, uh, making that a standard requirement now, at least a two-factor. As Jim went through with everyone, the tamper evidence ceiling, making sure that we're creating integrity and security of that ceremony. Uh, the recording is very important, making sure that you could protect that and keep it as a backup from unauthorized use, given the privacy concerns of many states and others. And the recording of the notarial ceremony, we created here this bifurcated where many states have their own standards that were perhaps five years, some were a bit longer, some were at our minimum seven years. So again, creating the ability to meet within what we think are the most aligned standards, but creating a minimum here. Again, this is the floor, not the ceiling, although for some states it meets both. We also looked at other things that we think are important to ensure that we're balancing that authentication and the privacy. And so making sure the lender maintains or has access to the recording of the notarial ceremony for the life of the loan. Again, the notary has their own standards that they're going to keep that recording. We wanted to be sure the lender has access to that, not only for authentication purposes later, potentially down the road, but also so that we have integrity around what happened in that ceremony, making sure that we can call that back up and see what happens. Again, lenders don't necessarily have to keep it. It's making sure they have it or have access to it. A very important uh, requirement that we feel is almost paramount here is the county recorders and looking in the states and counties where it's located and making sure they accept the remotely notarized documents. I think that's something that we feel like is of ultimate importance here, along with this uh, privacy and authentication, making sure that you are following and looking at that, that it was properly kept and there was no rejection there. Uh, it was a very important factor for us looking at the constructive notice and other items in state laws. So making sure that it's accepted it goes a long way there. Um, title insurance obviously is really important to this group and making sure there's no exceptions. I know that that's generally in the standards here that there are some exceptions in states where it's not permitted by express law, but there cannot be an exception for the remote notarization in order to be GSE accepted. We also felt it important that lenders not require borrowers, especially in these times, to use remote notarization and make other options available. We don't dictate what those are. That could be traditional notarization. It could be the remote ink sign notarization, whatever's permitted by state law. But that's something that they should look at. I think it's also important to note on these requirements and minimum standards that we're aware that there are various vendors out there making general offerings around remote online notarization. And what we've seen is that most of these vendors can meet these minimum standards and do meet them fairly easily, regardless of the state they are located in. So uh, we're also aware that many title companies are requiring particular vendors. The GSEs do not require a particular vendor or necessarily a vendor at all, but we'll note that we're aware that vendors are offering this and most do meet the, the minimum standards and additional requirements.
The states where we accept Ron, again, it's important to note this is an aligned approach. Jim and I spent uh, several days, weeks, I, they've all bled into each other at this point, but we went through all of these states looking at where we will accept a remote online notarization from. This is, I believe it, at my latest count, 45 states plus the District of Columbia. So again, this is where a loan can have a remote online notarization and it will be accepted by the GSEs. What about notes? I understand from Steve, this is a popular question and we understand why it's a popular question. Can a borrower electronically sign a promissory note that is not an e-mortgage? The answer, unfortunately, is no. And it has very little to do, quite frankly, with GSE standards and more to do with uniform law. Um, the UCC is what we're all beholden to. And unfortunately, the UCC does not recognize electronic signatures on paper notes at this point. Uh, negotiable instruments still need to be wet ink signed if they are in paper. The only way to deliver an electronically signed promissory note is to be an electronic e-mortgage approved lender at both uh, GSEs. I believe you can go and each GSE has their own websites and information so that you can look at that and become eligible if, if a lender is uh, looking for that, but um, there are no wet inks. Wet ink must have a uh, paper note ink, wet ink signed. Lenders uh, using e-notes though have to have an electronic note vault and it has to integrate with the MERS registry and all of the MERS requirements. I won't go through all of these, but again, we're looking for things that can distinguish between the authoritative copy of the e-note again, to preserve integrity of the note and prevent unauthorized viewing, again, privacy. Those are things that are of paramount importance and a part of what we looked at in the minimum standards. that. Um, maybe if you guys want to sort of walk through um, some of that, uh, if you missed anything, and then maybe dig in a little bit more on the, the second question here. Sure, I think or, Jim's I actually going to take the first question. Yeah, okay. I'll, um, am, I, uh, am I on? Uh, am I online? You are on. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, so in the immediate aftermath of our of our March 31st communications, uh, where we uh, lay, laid out uh, some some of these things we've been talking about, there were uh, quite inevitably and and uh, properly uh, uh, questions around some details in, in terms of clarifying some items. So we did come out with uh, FAQs in the in the aftermath of that. Uh, one of these uh, is, uh, I, I think, maybe um, re related to what Brooke was was just talking about, but maybe a slightly uh, you know d different angle. Do, do the GSEs permit remote online notarization on loans that include wet ink signed promissory notes, i.e., uh, non e mortgages? And and the and the quick and clear answer there is is yes. Uh, the RON process, uh, obviously the note is not a notarized document anyway, so the thing that separates uh, an e-mortgage from a non-e-mortgage is the fact that it has an e-note or not. Uh, and, and so the RON process is available uh, for uh, loans that, that are e-mortgages or, or not e-mortgages, because as we all know, except for the note, uh, many, many, many closings are, are hybrids. They, they use electronic uh, documentation and electronic signatures for uh, many of the pre-closing and closing documents, and, that, and that's all uh, supported by the GSEs, even if, it's, uh, even if you're not an approved e-mortgage uh, seller. It just, just means the note is going to be paper and ink signed, as Brooke talked about. 
So, so the answer there is, uh, is, is a clear yes. This process, and there shouldn't be any confusion about that, this process is available for, uh, for uh, either of those closings. And the, uh, the, other, uh, the other bullet point there is that uh, it, it notes that in, amongst our requirements is uh, that uh, the sellers maintain the recording of the notarial ceremony for the life of the loan. And does this mean the sellers are responsible to obtain a copy of the recorded notarization and retain it in their files for the life of the loan? And, and the basic answer there is that no, they're not required to go get a separate copy uh, of that notarial ceremony recording and maintain it. Uh, typically, the no, the uh, in a RON process, the technology provider uh, is is uh, recording that and keeping a copy of that so that the 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 uh, the lender, the seller can uh, uh, can leverage that fact and allow that uh, technology provider to store it for them as long as they have some arrangement where they can get access uh, access to it for that um, for that period of time we don't uh, try to prescribe uh, that the lender has to have its own separate copy if it's if it's got access through the uh, technology provider so I guess we're ready to go on to the next uh, next slide. Uh, okay, and this is and, and this is again uh, talking about the remote uh, uh, ink signed notarization uh, that that sometimes gets known as uh, RIN. Uh, at, at, at least in Freddie Mac's uh, materials, we don't use that acronym, but it it, it often does get referred to as as that. Um, and uh, so, do guidelines permit loan closings in which the notary public uh, witnesses the borrower wet sign uh, uh, the documents remotely through those technologies and receives the borrower's signed documents uh, to complete the, uh, again, ink signed notarization? And uh, uh, we do um, we do allow those they're not they're not RON so therefore they don't they don't have to meet the uh, minimum technical standards and um, uh, and uh, speaking a little bit for Fannie they've got those best practices uh, that uh, that I think were uh, were talked about but they're not requirements and Freddie Mac doesn't have any of those uh, with with regard to uh, the this ink signed. Uh, process and it also is not dependent upon being in one of those permitted RON states uh, in in order to do this. Typically, these things are now these things came about because the temporary governor's order said you can do this in our state even if uh, even if our laws say personal appearance uh, within within our state uh, will deem that those uh, personal appearance requirements are satisfied uh, by uh, the uh, the notary watching on these uh, on these particular uh, technologies so uh, and again it's uh, it's overlaid with the fact that you have got to be able to determine you can get it recorded um, and that uh, there's a title policy that doesn't take exception to um, to this uh, to this process. But we have put out an FAQ each of us uh, that came along a little after the initial FAQs that that clarified uh, that this process was something that that we would uh, that we would uh, accept loans using that process under those uh, under those circumstances. Um. And I'm going to turn it back over to Brooke, if if I may, uh, to talk about the job aid on on these uh, RIN uh, closings, because again, that that is a that is a particular Fannie Mae uh, uh, job aid. So, uh, Brooke, if you wouldn't mind. Thanks, Jim. Yes, Fannie Mae coined a term that is uh, Fannie Maeism. Here we called it a RIN. So we have twins, Ron and Ren. And the remote ink sign notarizations, we have the same FAQ, again, that was aligned with Freddie Mac on the minimum standards for a remote ink sign notarization. At Fannie Mae, we felt like it was important to offer some additional insights to clarify any confusion around how to distinguish what is a remote online notarization and what is a remote ink signed notarization. We created the job aid, which is a link from FAQ in our FAQs, which I believe will be provided at the end of the presentation to everyone. But I want to be sure to point out that the job aid walks through what a typical 
remote ink signed notarization may be. And as Jim pointed out, these are really creatures of these uh, executive temporary orders from the governors of the various states. I believe we're up to 20 some at this point, which does not necessarily overlap with the remote online notarizations states table. So again, these are creatures of state law, need to be checking whether they're authorized under either state law or temporary orders. But we looked at how does this happen? The first thing is it's typically happening in paper closings and not happening with e-closings. The notary is watching someone using audio visual assisted uh, technology. That's how they're watching and witnessing the signing of the document. And again, you're watching the borrower physically sign a document. They're generally using things like Skype or FaceTime, Zoom, other audiovisual assisted technology. The borrower is returning the documents to the notary, either postal. Uh, they could be, we've heard others are sort of watching them sign it in their cars and then they're leaving them on their hood and the notary grabs them whatever the case may be. And then the notary is again, physically and manually applying a notarial seal to the loan documents. The biggest thing to remember here is RON takes place in the electronic world. RIN is not taking place mostly in, an, in the technology. It's a technology assisted notary, but it's happening with physical loan documents and not in the electronic documents. So we also created what we think are best practices. I think if you look at these, our preference would be that you use these types of same uh, authentication that protects privacy and creates integrity around what's happening in the notarial ceremony. It's again, mirroring what we think the RON minimum standards are. Uh, these are not quite as stringent and they're all not there, but it's reviewing the ID via two-way and capturing it um, via electronic image. The system measures need to prevent some authentic, you know, provide some authentication, integrity, and security, again, to protect privacy and making sure you have a record and backup. Uh, we think that the RIN notaries should be keeping a backup of the electronic records there and recording the portions of the ceremony to ensure that we can uh, access it later. Uh, one thing to note here is these are best practices and not required minimum standards. I think that's the biggest difference between RON and RIN as well. We didn't create these minimum standards for all to follow. We put these out there as what we think should be industry best practices when uh, conducting a RIN transaction. a little bit and talk about power of attorney and uh, to start us off in that spot we want to bring in uh, uh, John Vielso at Freddie Mac to, to uh, kick us off and then I know he's going to pass pass the baton to a couple of his colleagues there. Uh, good afternoon and good morning to those of you on the West Coast. Uh, my name is John Valdivielso and I'm an Associate General Counsel for Freddie Mac and I've been, had the honor of working with uh, the colleagues of mine here at Freddie and at Fannie and at FHFA to put together this set of uh, new rules and flexibilities that will hopefully allow uh, uh, closings to occur uh, in a way that is safe for, for, uh, for everyone involved. Uh, including your employees and and our clients. So, the the rules that uh, we used to have, uh, actually, at least in in Freddie's case, were relatively light. Um, uh, the uh, in in our case, we had restrictions on who could use the power of attorney. In in Freddie's case, it was only uh, familial members, uh, personal uh, relations, and fiduciary uh, persons. In Fanny's case, it was a little broader. Um, but certainly had some exclusions for uh, lender employees. Um, uh, we required that all POAs be uh, notarized, that they were recorded, 
Uh, we also had restrictions on when they could use uh, the POAs at all. And, and Fanny and excuse me, in Freddie's guide, we uh, required that there had to have been an emergency, which the servicer, excuse me, the seller, the lender documented. Um, but due to the, the the reality of what is hitting the country now, and in order to help uh, closings continue to go through, and for borrowers to to get their loans. Uh, we have been working with FHFA um, and the two GSEs together and receiving a lot of input from the industry and uh, hats off to Alta for coordinating a lot of that and providing a lot of in, uh, input to us so that we could hopefully uh, meet your needs and, uh, and provide uh, an environment where you can continue to do uh, your very important jobs. So to talk about what things we've changed, I will hand it off to Mr. Burley at, at Fannie. Uh, thanks, John. Um, I would also like to thank Alta. Uh, John is not under uh, is not mistaking this. This was really uh, something we felt we needed to address uh, when we were hearing uh, concerns expressed by Alta and its members. And so, obviously, powers of attorney are not a high tech tool like the ones we've been talking about with Ron. Um, they're an old school one, and so both Fannie and Freddie Mac announced uh, to lenders, and I stress that's to lenders because that's where we communicate most things, uh, changes to our eligibility requirements related to COVID-19 uh, to address the greater use of powers of attorney during the time of social distancing. Uh, these were approved March 31st and are effective for loans that have application dates until May 17 of this year. And in recognition of the audience, we have today, we wanted to focus on the provisions that impact you in the title insurance industry. There are other things relating to powers of attorney that may impact lenders more. But first, I'd like to point out that both GSEs now will permit an individual who's employed by a title insurer or a title agency to act as attorney, in fact, for a borrower and execute documents. Second, if the title agency employee uh, is acting as the attorney in fact, then we will require a closing protection letter or similar indemnity arrangement be in place. Uh, third, we relax the requirement for notarization for the power of attorney in, in connection with some refinances. It will be the lenders who tell you which uh, need to be notarized uh, because they they will be able to distinguish where our rules apply. Uh, fourth, fourth, the RON requirement, if a notarization is required, we will recognize RON uh, in all states uh, unless the power of attorney has to be recorded by state law uh, in connection with its use, and then it's limited to the states in the chart uh, that Brooke uh, presented. Finally, and probably most significantly, for closing agents um, in all permitted uses of powers of attorney for borrowers, there must now be a confirmation that the borrower understands the key terms of the loan and understands the finality of the attorney in fact's execution of documents on their behalf. This confirmation is done simply by a conversation, telephonic or over the internet, that either the lender or the settlement agent carries out. Who is going to do it in any particular loan needs to be coordinated between the settlement agent and the lender. And a simple memo or other confirmation that this conversation occurred uh, is all that's required to confirm that this step has been met. Now, Fannie Mae had an existing mechanism already in place in our selling guide for when a title employee is acting as the attorney in fact. In those case, if that's in that situation, those provisions still apply and there's some very specific things that we've called out. It's not radically different, but we expect those uh, circumstances to, uh, those requirements to be followed. Um, we've also prepared a number of FAQs uh, on this new guidance and I'd like to ask, uh, ask John to uh, address those uh, and I'm mindful of the time we have left. 
And thank you, John. And I will uh, we'll hit these quickly because I'm sure we want to address as many questions as possible. Um, and these have to do with that pre-closing discussion. Of course, the, the, the point there is that we want uh, the borrower, who may not understand really how a POA works or be familiar with that, to understand that there will be a closing and the closing uh, at the closing, they won't be take, you know, fulfilling their traditional part of going through the documents and signing each one of them, that someone will be doing that on their behalf, and that they understand that at, at closing, they're going to be uh, uh, obligated to the terms of a mortgage. So um, it does not have to be uh, anything formal, um, but uh, the, 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 either the employee of the lender or, or an employee of the title agent uh, or insurer uh, sit down or, or have a phone call or an internet call and just go over uh, what's going to happen at closing. And that can happen at any time within the, within the prior three days. The point there is that the final closing disclosure be available so that those final terms can be discussed with the borrower. Um, and as for the acknowledgement, uh, it can either be in, you know, recorded. If, it, if it's part of a recorded conversation, it can be in writing. Um, following up on that, it can be, um, you could have a recorded conversation um, uh, and then have a written uh, acknowledgement um, following up upon it. Um, the point is that, that we just want some evidence that the borrower was um, uh, was explained or uh, they had an explanation given to them about what was going to happen so that um, the borrower later on uh, won't be um, uh, tempted to, uh, to go back, quote unquote, on the terms of, of the transaction. So, uh, I think that's uh, it for these two FAQs, and we would love to get to uh, some of the uh, talk about the title issues involved and then get to some questions. Great. So, uh, yeah, I think we're going to turn now to John Breeding to talk about some of these gap issues uh, before we uh, we turn then to uh, Q&A before we uh, end the day here. Sure. Uh, hi, my name is John Breeding, and I work for Freddie Mac. Uh, insurance uh, policy manager. So I manage the policies that we have for title insurance. Um, so real quickly, and just being mindful of the time, I wanted to thank ALTA for um, providing us such great feedback. We're really working uh, to get feedback from industry, and uh, we really appreciated really appreciated that. Um, when the uh, COVID started, we were concerned about the recording offices closing. Uh, so one of the first communications uh, that both GSEs published uh, was just a quick reminder in our bulletin and lender letter about our current guide requirements. Um, both, and I just want to cover those real quickly with three with the three bullets here. Uh, just a reminder that both GSEs require the 2006 auto loan title form. Um, covered risk 14 in that form uh, include does include the gap coverage. Uh, that's for the, obviously for matters arising between the loan closing date and the mortgage recording date. Um, so we're, we're good with that and that coverage. Um, the only thing is we want to ensure uh, that the uh, Schedule B of the policy does not uh, exclude that. So the GSEs will accept this as long as there's no exception for this coverage in the Schedule B policy. Um, so these are existing policies uh, for both the GSEs. And uh, we really appreciate the efforts also from ALTA for the tracking of the recording offices, and we've been using that report diligently. So thank you. So I want to uh, remind listeners, if we don't uh, have a chance to get uh, to your questions, this webinar certainly is being recorded, and we will um, respond uh, to your questions uh, after the webinar, make sure that those are sent around to everyone who's registered. Um, I also want to, before we dive into the, the Q&A with our remaining portion, uh, we have one final message uh, from our sponsor, Data Trace. As the speed of business increases, you need accurate and robust title data to drive efficiency so you can work smarter and faster. You need solutions that solve the challenges of today and prepare you for tomorrow. Data Trace is the nation's leader in title data with a suite of title services to support all of your title needs. From title searches and title search automation to real estate tax research and title and property report production and solutions to help your business grow. Advance your business beyond where it is today with Data Trace, the leader in title data and automation. So Steve, I'm gonna uh, kick it over to you. Uh, I know we've had a number of questions that have come in. Um, I'm gonna let you sort of lead us through and, and the panelists 
uh, through some of those questions before we uh, expire on time here. Today. All right. Thank you, Chris. And so we'll, we'll try to get through as many questions as we can right now. But let's start off with a couple of questions about the new RON guidance. And so first off, um, you know, in a RON trans in a RON transaction, <coughs> let's say. Um, you have a you have a notary commissioned in say the state of Virginia who's going to serve as the Ron notary for a property located in Texas. Is that now something that's allowed under the Fannie Freddie updated Ron guidelines? I'll I'll take that one. I guess if uh, if you can get me uh, get me live or maybe I am now. Uh, is everybody hearing me? Uh, this is Jim Newell at Freddie. Uh, the uh, the the short, quick answer to that is is yes. That's uh, that's what we sometimes uh, used to and and maybe still do refer to as interstate Ron, uh, and that's uh, a creature of the Ron statutes in like 23 states, I think now. Uh, started out with Virginia, which was a controversial, uh, provocative, if you will, move uh, back in 2014 or whenever they came out with the first uh, statute where they say our notaries can go notarize anywhere in the country and anywhere in the world. They're authorized to to uh, to do it. The And that uh, followed suit in, in Texas and several other states, Florida, and, and all, you know, uh, like I say, 22, 23 of them now. Um, the One of the issues there, of course, is that it's a one-way street. They say... Um, We'll let we'll let our notaries go notarize somewhere else, but it doesn't say we'll we'll let somebody else's notaries come in and do our properties, and it doesn't, uh, and and it doesn't, uh, and it couldn't uh, uh, have authority over another state's notary to say you have to accept this. So it becomes a uh, a process of analysis. Obviously, in the states that have the statutes, um, it's a slam dunk. You can you can uh, do it there. In terms of going out of state, as the question poses, um, it's a combination of okay, it's authorized in in Virginia, let's say, to to go out of state. But okay, if, if you're going to uh, in uh, in uh, Steve's example, uh, Florida, I think he said, um, no Texas, I think. Um, they have their own own law, but anyway, let's say, let's say Texas. Yeah, you could do that. The question is, does Texas uh, have a likelihood of recognizing uh, that notary process and, and not having it a challenge? So it's kind of their overall legal landscape in terms of recognition of, of out-of-state notarial acts and whether or not that would extend to a an electronic number one and number two a remote electronic uh, notarization but that's what the list of states is on that table that uh, Brooke uh, talked about is uh, 45 states and the District of Columbia we say we say yes either they have a Ron law that would per permit it uh, there or we have analyzed their overall legal landscape and showed enough likelihood that uh, that it would not uh, be challenged would be recognized so that you can do it so the uh, the GSEs will accept those uh, uh, loans where the mortgage premises are in those states to have the notary license in another state with authority to go out of state to, to do that. Um, that's It's a complicated question, really, because it's a complicated legal situation, but that's the bottom line. All right. Uh, another question that's come up a couple of times and kind of flows into what you just talked about, Jim, is, you know, obviously these, these guidelines for RON or for uh, if it's going to be a wet signed uh, process for RIN, um, really are just your guidelines for what's saleable to the GSEs. But title companies also need to work and, and focus on what underwriters are going to allow and what lenders are going to allow. Um, and so the question that we've got coming in is, you know, are underwriters, you know, allowing the use of, uh, of this remote ink sign notarization or following or allowing people to sign documents under some of these emergency orders? And the answer is yes, there are certainly some that are, are, are doing it in some transactions. There's also some trepidation from others. Um, you know, I think you need to really talk with your underwriter, talk with your lending instead with the, the lender and the originating lender in this case to understand what they're going to be concerned with and what they're going to allow. Because just because the, the, the GSE guidelines are here, that's only, you know, that that's one big part of the story, but it's not the entire thing that you need to clear before you go forward with this. So, you know, make sure you have those conversations. All right. Uh, next question. Why don't we go with this one? Um, what about the companies on the... Uh, e-closing technology service providers list that both Fannie and Freddie have. Are those qu companies, quote, approved by Fannie and Freddie or 
how should we treat them as, as users? Sure. Um, I think that what we provide there are for are on the different uh, websites for e-mortgages and signing up, and we provide different ones. They are not, the, like I said, the only approved ones. They're certainly just suggestions. I can only speak for Fannie Mae, but we do not necessarily endorse uh, the providers. They're there as suggestions, given that we service a wide variety of lenders who may all not have access to the same information. So leveling the playing field there to make sure they all understand there are different providers and technology service providers out there. Perfect. Thank and you. And I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll speak for, for, for I'll speak for Freddie Mac and and, uh, and echo that in terms of not endorsing this. We we have several lists include in terms of approved providers for e-mortgages, uh, creating e-notes and vaults and things. But we do have a list that talks about uh, three, I think, of the vendors that we know provide uh, the RON service, and it's there for informational purposes, not because we uh, particularly uh, approved some specific technology, but we do know that. That they offer those services and seem to meet the requirements that uh, we've laid out here. Perfect. Thank you. So another question that's come in is about kind of the uh, time frame for these you know, temporary guidelines. And I know uh, you know the the, the the LPOA guideline that that the that John Burley and John Valvioso went through says for applications uh, are you know accepted uh, before May seventeenth, I think. Um, are these temporary guidelines, or do you expect uh, the RON, these new RON guidelines and the LPOA guidelines to stay in place after this COVID crisis? So I can speak for the RON. The RON in Fannie Mae, and I believe at Freddie Mac as well, are both intended to be permanent changes. They are not temporary at this point, uh, although we reserve the right to make changes as uh, states and other ideas. You know, there could be a federal passage of the SECURE Act, which would change potentially some of the application of what we all had. But until that, ours is permanent in Ron. I'll let John and John speak to limited power of attorney. Yeah, I'll uh, go ahead, John. So uh, we aligned on this, uh, the effective date being for application received uh, uh, on or before May 17th, uh, as for, so that by its very nature is going to, uh, limit the number of, of loans that will, that will go through. And so provides an effective expiration date of, of when the, that pipeline, um, runs through. John, do you have anything else to add? Uh, no, I would agree. Uh, I mean, it's always dangerous to make predictions about the future. Um, but, these really were intended to deal with this uh, certain circumstance. The question is, uh, how long will the circumstance prevail? So I wouldn't be surprised, and this is my own personal, uh, that this uh, May date gets extended, uh, but that's really driven by larger circumstances and not just by our own sort of view of the situation. It's, it's a need-driven Agreed. question. Could could, uh, could I uh, take just two seconds to uh, add on to a little bit what uh, Brooke said? In terms of the RON, that's exactly right. Uh, in terms of those wet ink sign RIN, quote unquote, uh, transactions, there's not a date by which they are temporary. However, m many of those transactions are only enabled by an executive temporary order of the governor. And so obviously, if that uh, order expires and it's not extended, then then that process would uh, would not be uh, available, not because of Freddie Mac's or Fannie Mae's contract, uh, but but because it doesn't comply with law without that uh, in person requirement being suspended. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Okay, so I know we are coming uh, close up to our time. Uh, we're gonna do, I think, two more questions uh, before we, and so we'll go just slightly over, so I apologize for that. Um, so on the topic of limited powers of attorney, the question is, you know, does uh, should the limited power of attorney or can the limited power of attorney just name the title agency as the executor of the power of attorney versus an individual employee? Or uh, does it need to be an individual employee since uh, which which could cause issues given that closing protection letters are typically in the name of the agency and so is the agency's uh, errors and omissions insurance. Yeah, I think that's a fair question. Uh, I, 
I think it's fine. Uh, and I think John views it the same way that if it is the agency or, or the insurer whose name and then they delegate it in the normal course, uh, I think as long as it's it's clear that the person is is been delegated under that, uh, it's OK. Uh, and we understand the, the context of the indemnity and we don't want to do anything to adversely affect that. Perfect. So. Back to the topic of Ron, maybe this is a quicker one. Um, do these new Ron guidelines apply just to single family housing, uh, single family loans, or do they also apply in the multifamily uh, sector as well? They were single family uh, was the intent. The, the bulletin was was a was a single family related. So uh, I can't uh, can't answer exactly for for what may be in the offing for in, anything in multifamily. But the requirements that we put out and the expanded use of of, uh, of the process was uh, intended for, for single family. Perfect. Um, so this question comes in on those those emergency RIN types of closings, then it's, you know, if the signed documents are delivered to the notary via an overnight service after they've witnessed and seen the borrower sign them, is there an issue if the notary date is uh, a day later than the date that the borrower put on the signature line? Does that create red flags that are going to create issues? Sure. So I think a lot of, if you go back and, and again, we are asking the lenders to comply with law and lenders need to look at the executive orders and many of the executive orders actually tackle this issue and they need to handle it in accordance with how the executive order uh, directs them to handle dating issues. All right. So let's get back onto the topic of uh, of note of e notes again. So I, if I'm pulling up the question correctly. Um, our, our, you know, so we, we talked about notes being different and under the UC, uh, under the UCC requirements. Is there any guess that at some point uh, those change, those requirements are going to be changed and you're going to allow e, uh, e notes in the future or expanded use of e notes in the future? So that's assuming a, let me, that's no. a loaded question. Jim, Jim uh, give the history. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm probably a good one to give the history because I'm an ancient uh, toiler in the trenches uh, back uh, in the passage of, of uh, UETA. Uh, I was part of that whole drafting committee and then uh, then because uh, many states couldn't pass a uniform version of the UETA, Congress stepped in and made it uniform with uh, with eSign. But the, the, the key point is that those e-signature laws uh, recognize that uh, it wouldn't work with an electronic note. Uh, if you wanted to keep it a negotiable instrument like we, we all know and love that can be transferred uh, back and forth, uh, that needed to be a, a paper, wet, ink-signed uh, animal. Um, and, and so these e-signature laws created something else uh, called a transferable record, which was not governed by the UCC, uh, but were governed by those e-signature laws uh, that had to meet certain standards for electronic creation and, and signing. And if you did it in just the right way, there's no such thing as an original, so you have an authoritative copy, et cetera, et cetera. If you, if you met all those requirements, requirements, uh, then you'd have the equivalent uh, treatment of a negotiable instrument for a paper note. But what that means is uh, it's uh, some of these things that get proposed are neither fish nor fowl. Uh, they're, they're, they're not uh, negotiable instruments that are enforceable under the UCC, um, and they're, they're not done to meet the requirements of creating an e-note as a transferable record. So that, that's why uh, the answer to that is, is uh, no, there's there's no nothing in the immediate uh, offing that looks like it could could uh, accommodate just taking a you know uh, like any other document and and making it electronic and signing it electronic and say hey this is a note enforce it it wouldn't wouldn't work in terms of the transferability in the secondary market uh, etc. So someday maybe uh, someone can contact the uniform law commissioners and, and get them to uh, you know to to tackle uh, to tackle that one um, uh, and and there have been uh, some creative proposals around uh, promissory note registries that, that could 
uh, possibly have uh, uh, gotten you to that point, but they're not they're not out there right now. So you either got to be the fish or the fowl, uh, and we have the e-mortgage uh, approval process that's pretty pretty quick once you set up the um, once you set up the integration with the Mersey Registry and, and get your vendors uh, lined up. Uh, it can be just a you know a, a few days a, a week or, or something to get the approval to do uh, e-mortgages. So there's a lot of a lot of renewed interest in doing that uh, in the current emergency. Sorry to take so long on that answer. No, thank you, Jim. All right, I'm going to turn it back over to Chris now to wrap up our program. So thank you all for your time today, and thank you especially to our folks from Fannie and Freddie for uh, for your expertise. Yes, absolutely. Thank. You. Just what a wonderful, um, insightful uh, presentation. We really appreciate it and appreciate your partnership. Couple items before we uh, run through some final announcements that I just want to note, uh, not to forget, as I said at the outset, um, you know, Alta's COVID Resource Center on our uh, home site, as well as a link through alta.org backslash coronavirus, all the information you need on uh, the pandemic and how it affects uh, our industry and our members. Uh, we also encourage you to take the COVID survey that went out yesterday. Uh, we want to make sure that we are um, understanding what's happening in the marketplace and with your businesses. Uh, so if you could take a moment to do that, that would be uh, greatly valuable and beneficial and help us better serve you. Uh, we also would encourage you to read our daily COVID-19 uh, a newsletter coming from our CEO, Diane Tom. And um, most importantly, uh, we'd like you uh, to think about um, what's coming ahead in terms of our next set of webinars. We'll talk about that. Um, we also want to talk uh, about our good deeds, uh, hashtag good deeds campaign. Part of our uh, efforts this year is to help elevate and share the stories of what you're doing uh, out in the community. And uh, particularly at this time, we know you're doing so much on behalf of so many. And so we encourage you, uh, as it says here on the screen, various ways to share hashtag good deeds uh, so that we can uh, make sure that those stories are getting out uh, to the broader public about how valuable, important, and caring our entire community is. So with that, uh, we again thank you for listening and I'm going to uh, turn it over uh, to Lauren and take us out. All right, thank you panelists and Chris. I would like to thank our featured webinar sponsor, the FNF Family of Companies and all other Alta Advocacy Summit sponsors for providing, for bringing us this important and timely content to you. As a reminder, the webinar has, is, is being recorded and we will make sure to share that information as soon as it's available, along with the questions we weren't able to address. Join us next week, April 28th at 1 p.m. for the second webinar in this series. Have a great week and stay well.